Hello. Hey, how you doing? Man, you know, we've talked offline before about how by the time we get to the moment of talking to each other and recording this podcast, we're like really good. But that would mm-hmm. belie a really horrible week. Super long, complicated week trying to walk our child through a complicated situation lots of moving parts, a lot of things that are outside of our control. And man, I tell you what, I was just locked inside of my own head and my own misery and my own fears and my own anxieties and trying to help my daughter and guide my family and support them and yet feeling so dysregulated and so uptight and anxious. Uh, man, it's, it was a hard, hard week, but I am legitimately excited and happy to be talking with you. Those things really do live together. Yeah, I get it. Some experiences, you can have heavy moments and still be good in the instant. Or uh, you can have a multiplicity of experiences living, like you said, at the same time in your life. Yeah, so true. We are multifaceted humans, aren't we? Yes, which uh, does bring me to the reason why I'm calling, actually. Oh, fantastic. I want to talk about this phrase that my wife used recently in a project that we're doing together. But it's just a phrase that really has captured me, and I've been thinking about it almost nonstop since she used it. And one thing that's a little different for me today is that normally I have lots of thoughts, lots of answers to lots of questions, and I want to refine my answers. In this conversation, I'm just really coming saying, okay, I have this blob of thought and I am curious to have you add to this blob of thought. This is going to be a very real-time exploration of a concept for me. Oh, I can't uh, wait. Yeah, I'm super excited. And it, this is the phrase that got me thinking that my wife used was the phrase transactional relationships. Okay. And I'm just curious, before you heard me say that phrase, what would you have thought if you heard somebody use that phrase? Yeah, uh, this comes up quite a bit in my workplace because we have members of our management team that have been accused of being transactional leaders, or at least defaulting to being transactional leaders. And so what is meant in that context by that statement is a leader who comes and just is simple exchange of quid pro quo. Like, I need you to do this, you do that for me, and we're set. I want you to fulfill these tasks by Friday, and you know, then we're on even ground. You know, at the end of the pay period, you get a paycheck for your efforts. That's Like, this is the transaction that we're doing. There's nothing else here. I'm not really concerned about how that makes you feel. I'm not really concerned about too much else other than, can you do the job that I'm asking you to do? Great, please do it. That's transactional leadership. And I think I would just import that same concept to the broader category that you suggested, transactional relationships, bringing that same sort of like quid pro quo into any other relationship or sphere. Yeah, that's exactly it. For uh, I, uh, One of the things I don't know that I've ever thought about until you just mentioned it is that leadership is simply a subcategory of relationships. Leadership mm. is just a type of relationship that you have with people. Mm-hmm. And my wife didn't refer to this, but it reminds me a lot of an author I ran across years and years ago when I was in seminary. I'm not even sure I actually ever read the book, but it's a book called I and Thou by Martin Buber. He was a Jewish philosopher or theologian or somebody like that. And the idea of the book was that 
every day we engage with things. Uh, you know, I have a pen or a computer or my iPad or whatever, and I treat those things very appropriately as objects. They're tools that I need to use, and I just use them for their function, and then I forget about them. They do what they need to do, and that's it. And those relationships, Buber refers to them as I-it relationships. But one of the dangers that we have as humans is that we can import that I-it relationship into our relationships with other people. I remember seeing this with kids when my kids were little. I would watch a little kid who was just growing into that playing with other kids phase. And, you know, the little kid would go and try to treat the some other little kid like a doll, moving the arms or trying to position them or whatever. And the little kid just did not distinguish between playing with a doll and playing with another human being. <laughs> yeah. That is the ultimate I-it relationship. Right. One of the things we're always trying to grow into as adults and hopefully as mature people, I, Buber suggests, is that we go beyond I-it with other human beings to what he calls I-thou relationships. That is treating another human being like a fully orbed person rather than like an object. Mm. What do you think? Does that, does that square with what you were thinking when I first used the idea of transactional relationships? Yeah, I'm really excited actually to explore more the other side that you just started to articulate, which was the I-thou relationship. And I'm curious because I do think that we need to grow into that, but I'd like to hear a better, more robust definition of what thou entails, that what is the difference between I, it, and I, thou. Um, but beyond that, like, I think it would be neat to explore when we should do that and when we shouldn't in lots of different areas and spheres of our life, because I could see how this would apply to theology, right? That's something that's on my mind. Is God an object of our knowledge, or is he a subject that interacts with his creation? So is God an it? Is God an object of our knowing and our conception? Or is he divine subject, divine life, movement, dynamism, and movement? So I think that there's. it could apply to theology, it could apply to marriages, it could apply to a variety of other things. But Intuitively, I don't think, not in the same respect anyway, would it apply to the grocery clerk. Although my late mother-in-law would completely disagree. She never met a clerk that she didn't talk to for like 10 minutes and like hold up the line and she knew everybody by name. She never met a, a stranger in her life. She just talked with everybody. So maybe we just need to adopt her perspective. I don't know. But anyway, that's no, what- no, I'm. I'm with you on this. You know, we were looking at the statistics for the podcast a while back, and the the listeners who are probably listening because of me are fairly evenly broken up between people from the Northeast and people from Missouri. People from Missouri, if I can talk to you for just one minute, you do not need to be friends with the person who is checking you out at the grocery store. <laughs> And if I am behind you, I am desperately imploring God that you will just move it along because I want you to treat the grocery clerk with an I-it relationship. I desperately want that. So please understand, we are not saying this is the way all interactions should happen. But I am asking myself, you know, you, you said a few minutes ago or a few moments ago, you're interested in exploring the other side, meaning not the I-it relationship, but the I-thou relationship. And I'll be honest, even when I was trying to figure out how to describe this topic, transactional relationships 
versus fill in the blank. I am so unsure what goes on the other side of that fill in the blank that I can't even offer a final answer. I've played around with things like transactional relationships versus holistic relationships, transactional relationships versus empathic relationships, transactional relationships versus authentic relationships. I just don't know what to put on the other side of the equation. And I'm not sure if that simply speaks to my poverty of experience with the other side. I think it may be that I'm just far more familiar with transactional relationships than with whatever the other thing is. That may be. I do think that in some respects... You're (laughs) self-excluded. Right. Hey, don't I get to define that? Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think it might be that we all default to transactional when we're not necessarily paying attention, when we fail to bring our whole selves to the present moment or to the encounter with another. So maybe that is the lacking piece, but in terms of defining what's on the other side, I think I would define that very, very differently depending on the relationship in question. I don't think I would feel comfortable with the same terminology if I'm talking about a leadership context as I would if I'm talking about the marriage context. I'm pretty sure my wife wants more in that category than I'm willing to give in the leadership realm. So... Sure. Yeah. And that I think that speaks to the fact that these two things, transactional relationships and whatever the other thing are, is are on a spectrum. But I still suspect that the other side of the spectrum will be the same, even if as a husband, you are at a nine and as an employer or manager or leader, you're at a seven. Let me go back to this idea of bringing my whole self. Mm. I don't think that I can and maybe even should do that in a leadership context. And so maybe that's what you're describing with the seven versus a nine or whatever number you might use. But I am actively holding back a part of myself in leadership contexts because Parts of me are inappropriate to bring to that relationship, whereas there really isn't a part of me that is inappropriate to bring to my relationship with my wife or my relationship with God. So I feel like that's qualitatively different, not just quantitatively different. Mm. Yeah, it could well be. And this could speak to some of the challenges I have wrestled with, you distinguish those so cleanly. In my world, those get so messy. I was just saying to a friend the other day that I have been at times the same person's pastor and their manager. And in regards to what we're talking about today, Those require very different relational approaches that I have not always known how to manage. You know, if somebody is having an emotionally complicated day, what does that mean for me as their pastor is one thing. What does that mean for me as their manager is another thing. I have often not known how to to navigate those things. And I know that Purely transactional relationships are not okay for either of those contexts. But again, I'm not sure what the other solution is. So I guess I want to split I want to split the parties up a little bit, maybe to help us explore this even further. Because I think there is the obvious what should I be doing in any given t- context and how do I know? And I think to some extent, that's the question we've been asking for the last couple of minutes. But then I think there's a whole separate question from the other person's perspective. And that is, what do they need out of any given encounter? 
Mm-hmm. If transactional isn't it, what is it that they need from us? Ooh. And that's a different question. That's a great question. I think transactional is about what do I need and what am I willing to give for it? Mm. I think on some level, asking the what does this other person need is the more loving approach. Man, that's a great question. And I think that really speaks to what the opposing option is. What do you need right now? What do you need from me? Rather than what do I need from you? Right. And I think we talked about leadership anxiety at one point. And leadership anxiety comes to bear in this moment too. It's very natural to be asking the question, what do I need to be doing for this person? What do I need to do in this moment? How do I get the most out of them? How do I support them? How do I, how do I, how do I? But flipping the question on its head, what do they need in this moment is a very different one. And and here's why. I just had a conversation with somebody whose heart is in the right place. They want to do good things for this person. They desperately want to be a source of healing and strength and all of these good things that you want somebody to do in your life. This person wants to do this for another person. And yet they're the exact wrong person to do it. The other party is not going to receive that from them for whatever reason. And that relationship is broken to a degree that this person, despite their best efforts, despite all of the things that they would love to do for this person, the best thing that they can do is not act and allow somebody else to fill that role. That's a different question, right? And the only way we get to that answer is what does the other person need? Not what do I need to be doing? What does the other person need? Yeah, it's when you said that question, what first came up to my mind was a meeting that I had today. I had a, in my schedule, a 15 minute time block of a meeting in which a parishioner was stopping by to pick up paperwork. I mean, I thought 15 minutes was generous. It literally could have been three minutes. But this person was shown into my office. And I said, as I often do the first time I meet somebody, hey, so I've never gotten to sit down with you. Tell me a little bit about your story. And I knew about four minutes later that this was going to be at least an hour. (laughs) Because... Their life story is complicated and heavy, as many people's is. And one of the things many of us need is just the opportunity to share our story and have someone else listen. And this particular person needed to share their story, needed to shed some tears, and I really just needed them to fill out some paperwork. (laughs) <laughs> right. And fortunately, I happen to make the right decision. So I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. It's just that as you were forming those two questions, what do I need versus what do you need? Never has the difference been so stark as in that meeting. For sure. So I want to kind of back up from the practical again here, though, on a spiritual or or theological level, I find myself asking when and how is it okay, if ever, to be transactional in our relationships? Because honestly, some of the most quote-unquote spiritual things I've ever been taught seem very transactional. We hit on some things about mentoring a few weeks ago when we were talking about discipleship without shame, and I was thinking about how transactional some approaches to mentoring or discipleship are. Let me get you through this book. Let me help you check mark these boxes. 
I was also thinking how often some approaches to evangelism are highly transactional. Mm. I just need to get my neighbor to church. I just need to share the gospel with this person. Really, the end goal of this relationship is I want to get them saved. When you and I were texting back and forth about this topic, I even took issue with the idea of transactional versus transformational relationships because the idea of a transformational relationship still on some level feels transactional. I am going to be friends with you in order to accomplish this thing that I want to accomplish. So so all of this to say, I feel like we are flying against the current a little bit, or at least against some mental models that I have. And so I want to always ask the question, what does the Bible say about this? Theologically, what do we think about relationships that would give us a context for whether or not transactional relationships are appropriate or at what point something else is required? And if so, what? Well, yeah, I, here's the fascinating thing because the very first two scriptural quotations that came to mind when you asked that question were diametrically opposed. The first thing I thought of was the fact that Jesus's name is Emmanuel, God with us. And that is the sum total of his presence being communicated to humanity. He is with us in a deeply present, spiritual, intimate way. That is on that other side of the equation that we talked about. But Mm -hmm. then... The other quotation that came to mind is, confess on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That is so, I think it embodies more than a transaction, so I don't want to reduce it to a transaction, but that is transactional language. But it certainly could be read that way, right? Right. So I I guess what I'm saying is there is a place for both, right? And I I guess I think of another scripture uh, moment Moses and the Israelites, they're about to go up against another invading army. Moses goes up on the mountain with Aaron and Hur, and he says to Joshua, go lead the troops in battle. And when Moses is lifting up his staff, the army is winning. And when his arm gets tired and he starts lowering it, the Israelites start losing. And right, we focus very much on the moment up on the mountain, but we skip completely over the transactional moment between Moses and Joshua, go lead the army. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is your task. Go do it. Right. Which is, you know, again, I have thoughts on both sides of this or or biblical references that come up on both sides of this. Paul's whole reference to the church as the body of Christ in which everybody is a part of the body by means of their function. You exist as part of the body because you have a function, a role to play. That is what membership means for Paul, as opposed to some of the modern, you get to vote or your name's on a roster somewhere. But that that could be highly transactional if left to its own devices. But then on the flip side of things, and, and I have some thoughts about those actually, but I want to get to one thing about Jesus that long confused me and that I really wrestled with was how non-transactional he was in his ministry. You want to be healed? I'd love to heal you. No strings attached. You want a miracle? I am going to do a miracle. No strings attached. Even moments where people may be perceived as trying to be transactional. Think about the garrison demoniac uh, who wants to follow Jesus almost as payment for his his miracle, his deliverance. Jesus says, nope. Right. No, that's not the way this is going to work. And I think the same is true. You know, the Joshua Moses story could only be taken as transactional outside of the context of their broader relationship in which Joshua is the only one who gets to go up on the mountain with Moses. 
Joshua is the only one who gets to go in the tabernacle with Moses when the presence of God falls. There are transactional moments in a fully orbed relationship that involves profound investment. Yes, uh, which is exactly why I thought taking that we we would be taking that verse out of context when we say confess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That is transactional language that embodies um, a, a much more dynamic relationship than is contained in that one sentence. Yeah, and I I think it's maybe it would be appropriate to say transactional conversations are fine. Transactional moments are fine. As a parent, there are moments I need to say, clean your room now. And <laughs> yeah. in my particular family, just recently, one of my children did not do their chores appropriately. And we use a debit card system. And one of my kids did not do their chore appropriately. And we debited them money, like we charged them for it mm. on the spot without talking to them. They did not get their full. They did not get their full allowance because they didn't do the job. Right. That was a f a fully one hundred percent transactional moment that exists within a context that is much more than transaction. This is a yes. piece of your shaping, guiding, molding, caring for. And raising your child, that is not in and of itself the definition of the relationship. Yeah, exactly. And I think I think two things about that. Number one, in any given relationship, except I will exclude the kind of employer-employee relationship that you have, because I will be curious what you think about that. I've never been in that kind of relationship on either side outside of the church since I was quite young. Any relationship that I'm in, the transactional moments must take place in the context of a more fully orbed relationship and B, on some level, the other person, the non-powerful person in an imbalanced relationship has a voice to define whether or not that relationship is adequately fully orbed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is wonderful because I would love to actually to speak for a moment about my individual context because yes, please. in the 911 center, it doesn't matter if it's mine or a thousand others across the country, almost all of us work for some sort of government municipality whether we work for a county, whether we work for a region of counties, whether we work for a city, we, by and large, work for the government. And there is no more depersonalizing place to work than as a functionary in a government. In order to have public accountability and in order to have some semblance of fairness and equity— Policies are often enacted and enforced regimentally in order mm. to preserve equality and public transparency. We always do this when X happens. And in some ways that's good, and in some ways that's wildly depersonalizing and mm. devaluing of a human being that is caught up in the system. And if we were to take a more humane approach and massage the response to the situation a little bit better. It would be better for the human and maybe more complicated for a public relations perspective. And so this dynamic plays out in my job as a supervisor that has to both support and enforce all the time. And the dynamic is often shifting too much in one way or the other. Well, I guess maybe probably only one way, which is people just feel dehumanized, demoralized, like a number, like a functionary. And it's hard to fight for humanity in that environment sometimes. But I also think on a broader scale, 
This is what we're learning about the workforce. There was a generation not too long ago that was highly, highly transactional in the workplace. And that Mm -hmm. led to some abuses and some hostile work environments that our society is actively trying to undo because we're recognizing that people need more than just pure transactionalism in the workplace. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. So what does it look like as the guy in the middle? The simplest version of this is my kids. My kids very seldom at 12 and 14 are they any longer saying after the fact, you shouldn't have made me clean up my room or you shouldn't make me do my chores or whatever. Like we're, we're done with those conversations because they know I am not going to listen. My <laughs> wife is far more gracious. And so she probably gets a little bit more of that than I do because she's a better listener and a kinder person and just all around a better human. But what my kids now say to me that I think speaks to the difference between a transactional moment and a broader relationship They'll say, we need more one-on-one time with you. Hmm. So, so they have a mechanism by which they can express when things get out of balance. And when they are feeling, I don't know that depersonalized or dehumanized is quite the right language there. But when the demands of the, of the transactional moments is heavier than the relationship can currently bear. They know what to say, and that's great, and I'm delighted that they do, and both of my kids have said this in the last week, and we have done things to, ooh, today's vocabulary word is ameliorate, <laughs> to ameliorate. I say I'm pronouncing that right. I say ameliorate. Ameliorate? That is how I pronounce it. All right. Nevertheless, my my driving point that I'm taking forever to get to here is what does an employee need to do to express the fact that the the balance is out of whack? I think every single 911 center has this narrative living inside of it. Management doesn't support us. Management doesn't get us. Management doesn't know what it's like to be behind the console every day. Management doesn't get it. And I think if I'm adding my own spin to it, I think that is the plea for connectedness to be seen, to be understood, to be supported. But it is a super challenging environment to do that purely because we are so caught up in a system that is mercilessly uniform. And that's a hard place to be. I would think the challenge would be the solution can't be something that can be checkmarked off. The moment it is something that can be checkmarked off, it is no longer actually a solution to the problem. Yeah, I think you're saying transaction is the problem. You need presence, not more transaction. Correct. And not more transaction like, okay, fine, let's spend some time together. We have the next hour to get to know each other. Go, right? Like, <laughs> um, Or let's, all, let's have an imp- employee lunch thing or whatever. Like thinking back to how to win friends and influence people, which is one of those classic leadership books. But one of the things he says in that book that I thought was fascinating was you have to take an authentic interest in the people around you. And if you are going to fake it, don't waste your time. Everybody will be able to tell. Mm. You actually have to choose to develop an interest in the other people, and they will be able to tell the difference, and they will be far more easily influenced by you if they discover that you care enough about them to take an active and intentional and selfless interest in them. Yes. Can I... I just want to piggyback on that as we close out this segment. You referenced earlier your kids' response to, I am lacking presence. I need more one-on-one time with you. And now you're talking about 
this intentionality to move toward and genuinely move toward. And I think both of these also apply to another realm, and that is marriage. I thought Mm. so much when you talked about your kids, I thought, that's it. My wife and I, and I'm sure many other people are in the same boat. We have so many transactional moments during the week. Are you picking him up from karate? No, I am. Okay, great. Okay. And then when, what time are you going to be home? All right. Do you need me to stop at the store to get bread? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll get bread. All right. And then you're going to make dinner and then I'm going to leave and right. And this is how life is. This is how we manage our lives transactionally. And those moments can stack up on one another to a point where you're like, whoa, 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 where, where are we in all of this? And the mechanism is a date. Is that one-on-one time? And Hmm. man, I'm feeling that our life is highly transactional right now. And we're going to get some time next weekend to get away as a family. And that's going to be wonderful. But I just think I, I couldn't leave this segment without addressing the fact that this belongs in a marriage conversation too. Mm, yeah, that's that's good. Well, hey, like you said, we need to transition out of this conversation. But before we, we're done, I just want to hear if you have any other thoughts. What other things have you been thinking about? Yeah, so I just read A.W. Tozer's book, The Purpose of Man. And this is, as Tozer is wont to do, a treatise on worship and the need for worship need for a life of worship. But in part of that book, he had some harsh criticism of the broader church community in America, a tendency within American churches to have a congregation full of, as he says it, first graders who never move beyond first grade. And he was specifically applying that to worship. And I found it really interesting in that context because worship is, in Tozer's mind, first grade material. Not to say like it's something we master and then move on from, but in the sense that it is foundational. It is step one. If we haven't learned to worship, he even later says, yeah, I think we should work for the Lord, but I don't think we should work until we've learned to worship. Worship is the building block, pure and simple. And until we've learned to do that, and we've incorporated worship into our lives, both personally and communally, we can't move on. We can't move forward. That's first grade material. We have to master phonics before we can learn to read. And I really found that to be super fascinating because I don't think that any of our, any of the church discipleship programs that I'm familiar with start with worship. I think we start with a lot of doctrine. Or maybe we tone down doctrine into, let's just get to know Jesus better. Let's read this gospel. But I don't know that the emphasis is placed on, let's teach you to be a worshiper. Let's teach you to have a dynamic and responsive relationship with the Holy Spirit, such that you can sense this Holy Spirit's movement in your life, that you can respond in worship and adoration to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's let that be foundational, and let's let everything else be subsumed into that as you continue to grow into worship. That's a different model for a beginner believer class or a discipleship program at the church. And yet, man, how transformational could that be for our congregations and for even the way you mentioned evangelism earlier— If evangelism flowed out of that, evangelism would become not a transaction, but an invitation to join the worshiping community. Mm. And man, what a great piggybacking thought off of our transactional conversation. What a, a powerful guard against being transactional with God, because worship is the one thing that to be itself, it cannot be transactional. Mm, that is so true. And if we teach that first, all the serving, all the evangelism, all the study, all the whatever flowing out of worship is a powerful guard against a transactional spirituality. Right. Or transactional churches. Mm-hmm. Very much so. 
Yeah. So I want to pause for a second, and I just want to invite everybody else to join this conversation. We're going to hear Josh from Missouri's thoughts here in just a moment, but I want to hear thoughts from all of you, the listening community. What do you think about transactional leadership? What do you think belongs on the other side? Could you help us define that? And could you help us flesh it out where it fits in different aspects of life? And where does worship fit in? So we would love to hear from you. And if this uh, conversation sparked something for you and you'd like to use it as a springboard for starting another conversation with somebody else in your life, we would love for you to share our podcast, share this episode or any other episode. That would be amazing. We would love to spark a conversation that way. So join us on Facebook, join us on Instagram, join us on Twitter. Just search for On the Phone with Josh and you'll find us and we can't wait to hear from you. So Josh from Missouri, now I'd love to hear your thoughts. So I am reading uh, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek by Annie Dillard. I uh, just read this. Oh my goodness. Wow. It is a book unlike any other. Yes. Uh, Did you physically read it or did you listen to it? I listened to it and I'm so glad that I did. How did that go? It's It's dense. I think uh, Eugene Peterson referred to it as a tour de force, and it absolutely is. Her language is so poetic, and it is so vivid, and yet so dense. She just has a lot of words, but she uses them so beautifully. But man, it's a lot of words. <laughs> That's I was listening to it, or excuse me, I'm reading it, not listening to it, uh, and I was thinking to myself, I don't know that my first go round with this book could be in audio form. Mm. I just don't know that I would catch half of what she was saying, but it is a beautiful book. Yes. A, a brilliant tour de France. Tour and de France. You're getting the yellow jacket. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to, I was going with the joke just to see if, if it would catch any traction there. <laughs> um, but you know, the thing that, caught me as I was, as I'm reading it, I'm in chapter two, well, I'm in chapter three now, but I was in chapter two earlier and chapter two is titled something like seeing or something like that. And she talks about these two ways of seeing the world. One that she describes as looking for the camera shot where you are stepping back from the reality and just being a passive observer, you know, there's a camera's distance between you and the world and it's very impersonal, very, ob again, objective. And the other way is when you don't have the camera between you and what you're looking at. And so you become a participant in it fully experiencing the moment that you are in rather than reflecting on the moment that you're in. Mm. That's the way to say what she's saying. You are a full participant in the moment rather than reflecting on the moment that you're in. And she says this to sort of sum up and before she moves on to another point, she says, but I can't go out and try to see this way. I'll fail. I'll go mad. All I can do is try to gag the inner commentator <laughs> to hush the noise of useless interior babble that keeps me from seeing just as surely as a newspaper dangled before my eyes. That is a stunning quote. Sometimes I just need to note the inner babble and set it aside. She goes on to say that we need to do so peaceably and calmly and sort of without judgment to ourselves. Otherwise, we just create more interior babble. But I just love this idea to hush the noise of useless interior babble that keeps me from seeing just as surely as a newspaper dangling before my eyes. That's my thought. That's so good. And I will say... I experienced the whole rest of her book as an exploration of doing just that, being immersed in the world and taking it as it is, 
being a full and alive participant to it. And Mm -hmm. her title for that, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, couldn't sum it up better. So, yeah, beautiful book. Yeah, I'm loving every second of it. I've wanted to read it for years, and I just have always wanted to give it proper attention, and now is the moment. So I'm excited. Nice. So I think that brings us to... uh, Our Witch Josh question for the week, right? It sure does. So our Witch Josh question this week is kind of fun. The Witch Josh question is, which Josh can juggle? Ooh. And the answer is both of us. Although we've never tried to do it together, so that could be interesting. I think I'd probably fail there. Yeah. I, I cannot juggle with another person. I have tried and failed. So I'd love to know, what is your limit? My limit is like three balls right in front of me with two hands or two balls with one hand. Like after that, it gets too complicated. My brain explodes and I'm done. So how far can you go? That's what I've got. I can do two in one hand. I can do three. I can do some tricks with three. Four is actually just juggling two in your left hand, two in your right hand comfortably enough to be able to crisscross two of the balls. Okay. That's, that's all juggling four is, but I can't do it. I know the mechanics of it, but I can't do it. Yeah, I have not even tried. My brain would explode. So maybe when we're on vacation together, our two families this summer, we will practice our juggling. There we go. That's what we're going all the way to Utah for. Hey, you got to do something while you're there. Yeah, absolutely. 157 degrees, and we're going to juggle. <laughs> ice cubes. We're going to juggle ice cubes. Yes, <laughs> yes exactly. Uh, all right. Well, until then, are we on for next time? Absolutely. I can't wait. I'll talk to you then. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.